Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening skies Let it resound loud as the rolling sea Sing a song Full of the faith that the dark past has taught us Sing a song Full of the hope that the present has brought us Facing the rising sun of a new day begun Let us march on till victory is won Psalm 11 says this church in the Lord I take refuge how then can you say to me flee like a bird to your mountain for look the wicked bend their bows and they set their arrows against the strings and to shoot from the shadows at the upright in heart when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And it says, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord is on his heavenly throne. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes are examining us. He says, the Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, our God hates with a passion. For the Lord is righteous and he loves justice and the upright in heart will see his face. There are important Sundays in the life of every church, Resurrection Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, Christmas Sunday, but this Sunday is a very important Sunday for our, all churches because if you are a human being, if you have blood rushing through your veins, if you are alive at all, then you saw this week the brutal killing of George Floyd. And if you watched that video, it was unthinkable. It shook our souls to the depths of who we are. We've, this is a, a narrative that has continued over and over and over and over. And I could not watch that video without becoming sick in my stomach, feeling pain and empathy for those who are suffering in ways that I am not. And whenever black people are killed at the hands of police and society remains indifferent and the criminal justice system is biased, then we all must collectively cry out that black lives matter. And I'm not talking about a movement, I'm just talking about a statement of fact. My father was black, my brothers are black, my friends are black in their lives. They matter. But when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Because if you're also alive and have blood pumping through your veins, then you also witness the brutal killing of multiple police officers in St. Louis and in Las Vegas and in New York. And I see the pain on the faces of my, the Chicago PD and the Lansing PD. And if you are a member of Freedom Church, this is especially sensitive because we all witnessed the brutal shooting of Officer Timothy Jones, who goes to our church. And, and it was perpetrated in the Park Forest Police Department. It was perpetrated by a young black man and I remember that morning it will always be in my mind because I stood over a boy that had been shot and I saw the his body riddled with bullet holes and I wept with their family and we held a prayer vigil for him and we saw Chief Jones and his family walk with strength and dignity through one of the darkest trials that I've ever seen anyone go through we also must declare that we need to back the blue but when the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do?
do. See, this sort of dichotomy between police and blacks just muddies the issue and causes us to lose focus of the real problems, self-defeating economic policies, social immobility. Did we forget about COVID-19? Did we beat it already? The jobless, the jobs are, are, are in chaos, unemployment, the erosion of, of the ability to provide and live, the incarceration rates, the erosion of marriage, fatherless homes. We are creating a culture of contempt for law and lifestyles of crime. And instead, as black folks, instead of disowning criminal behavior, we have a culture and a music culture that promotes violence. And although blacks are only 13% of the population, we know that they account for more than 50% of the homicide victims. And 94% of the time, the perpetrator is another black man. So in two, we see two young girls, black girls fighting in the street, someone in the black background, rather than trying to change the situation, they take her phone out and they yell out, world star. See, it's hard to play the victim when we are at war with the very culture we perpetuate and the emotional and mental stress that is coming in our hearts because of the hopelessness that we feel. This, this hopelessness creates so much tension in our hearts and our minds and our white brothers and sisters see injustice and they want to speak up, but before they can say this is wrong, they have to go and prove, hey guys, I'm not a racist. Look, church, if you go to Freedom Church, you already know I am white. I am black. My mama was a white woman who married a black man from the inner city of Chicago in the 70s. She was the daughter of a Methodist preacher from the South. She stood for black people, but they cannot talk of race or equality and opportunity if we lump all white people in with the sin of racism and slavery. So before they can even speak out and call something wrong or an injustice, we make them pass this litmus test. Are you black enough? Do you love us enough? Are you not racist? St. Augustine said you never judge a philosophy based on its abusers. There are good police and there are bad police. There are good preachers and there are bad preachers. There are good white people and there are bad white people. You cannot judge people based, you cannot judge a philosophy based on the ones that are abusing. How, church, can unity come? When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? See, in life, we will all find that many matters are seldom as stable and firm as we think that they are. David in this chapter is addressing what happens when the normal protections and securities of the people of God begin to disappear. Many scholars believe that this text is written in the context of his son Absalom trying to take over the kingdom by force? What happens when your own son wants you dead? What happens when the social fabric starts disintegrating? What happens when civil order explodes? What happens when there are riots in the middle of Jerusalem? When the foundations are being destroyed? God, what can the righteous do? One translation says it like this, there is nothing a good man can do when everything falls apart. What is our position, not as just black people and brown people and white people and Puerto Ricans and Asian? What is our position as a person of faith? Can we at least allow our identity be, to first be found in Christ? Or a better way to say it is, church, what can your faith do when the foundations are being destroyed? And David starts with what I believe is the most important point. He says, in Yahweh, I have taken my refuge. In Yahweh is important. There is an emphasis. David says, I'm not drifting around by this thing and this media and that thing and that. He says, I have taken refuge in Yahweh. He is my anchor. And when every foundation falls in your life and in my life, guess what? Yahweh still remains. God is still on the throne. See, this is a quote from David. He says in verse 2, he says, how can you say to me? How can you say to me, because scholars believe this is advice that David was getting from his close personal friend. He goes, run off into the mountains, hide David, hide. Everything is falling apart, David. You need to get out of Dodge, hide out, run, get away. Get away. And some of us want to do that right now, run, get away. And David says, how can you say that to me? This is an important statement because this is not from David's enemy. This is a, this is a word that was given to him from his friend. 
The Bible is trying to tell us that oftentimes bad advice comes from the people closest to us. Advice that is in opposition to your faith will come not from the devil, not from some radical group, not from some racially motivated person. Psalm 11 tells us that when advice comes that will tear apart your faith, it oftentimes comes from those you are connected with, in relationship with. Some advice is filled with care, it seems sincere, it's pious, it's, it's concerned, it's nice, and, and it's ringing with caution, but guess what? It can still be opposed to your faith. It might sound like a clarion call against injustice and still be opposed to your faith in God. We are living in a day and an age where discernment in all of us is desperately needed. Without discernment, you will walk when you should be running. There's a story in Dallas when the gunshots are going off and a young pastor was running with his son and a lady was just freaked out by what was happening and she was paralyzed in shock. And that pastor is running by, he said, lady, you need to get up. Those are real bullets. I know you're hurting and stressed and disheveled, but now is not the time to be emotional. Now is the time to run. Without discernment, you will be laughing when you should be crying. Without discernment, you will shout when you should be silent. So without discernment, you should fight. Sometimes Sometimes you need to run. Sometimes you should be angry from a righteous perspective. There are times that call for seeking cover and protection, and then there are times when you must risk it all. Discernment says, wait, hold off, let me think through the facts. Discernment says it's not just us against them. Discernment asks who is to gain from these po people polarizing our perspectives. Discernment asks, does it matter that this is an election year? Discernment forces us to take an introspective look and ask ourselves, if we are the problem and not the solution. The sermon tells us that love has always been more powerful than hate. Martin knew this, and he said violence as a way of achieving racial justice is both impractical and immoral. He said violence brings temporary victories, but never brings permanent peace. This reminds me of Philippians 1, and this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and pure and blameless for the day our Lord returns. We are all on social media and it is a melting pot of ideas and maybe this is just one more idea, but this text tells us that bad advice oftentimes comes cloaked in subtlety. The other issue with this advice is there is an assumption to this advice and the assumption, the assumption is this, Safety is our number one concern. It's all important. David, you should run away because self-preservation should be your highest goal. It is an idolatry of the self. We will never have a true prophetic voice in our culture coming from an individuals that value their own self-preservation. And this is all of us. We love jobs and we love titles and we love positions and we love status. We love security. We love our safe situation. So we lose our prophetic voice because risk crashes the idolatry of ourself and we love ourselves. We need more prophetic voices from every every tribe, every creed, more prophetic voices that are willing to risk it all. That's why the psalm begins, in Yahweh alone have I taken refuge. Because if you want to speak the truth, you have to find refuge in God and in God alone and not in the opinions of men. Verse two says, the wicked are bending their bow versus God. Notice the contrast. You see Yahweh in his holy temple. Yahweh is in his throne in the heavens and the Bible says his eyes gaze on, his eyelids test the sons of men. Now watch these images, his eyes are gazing upon us, his eyelids are looking over us and testing us. This is not a statement of inactivity, this is a statement of God's supremacy. This is not about his distance, it's about God's dominion. A throne is not about being removed but about ruling. We cannot think about God and his transcendence as distance or indifference but rather he is gazing, he is testing, he is watching, he is concerned. And the Bible says the Lord examines the righteous, but the wicked, those who love violence, he hates them with a passion. The wicked who love violence, God says I hate them with a passion. We love to say that God hates sin and loves the sinner, but this says God hates with a passion any of us who love violence. God is a lover of righteous 
deeds. Listen, church, I am no liberation theologian, but God has always been concerned about the oppressed and about the poor, about the widow and the orphan and the undeserved, uh, underserved and the downtrodden and the discouraged, those who violence is committed against them. And if I say I am on the side of God, then I have to begin to clothe my thoughts with empathy for someone who lives and operates in a completely different environment than the one I'm in. And this is the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He has a nature, he has a character, positive and negative. He is God with us, not God controlled by us. And that God is passionate against violence and evil and wrongdoing. He's permanently opposed to those who love violence. And the true rest we are all seeking will only come when that passionate God puts everything right. Have you ever owned a car where one of the tires has a slow leak? You go to the air station and at the gas station and you take your four quarters out and you put that air. And guess what? When you put that air in that tire, that, that car drives fine. But every three to four weeks, you have to go and place a little bit more air in that tire. There will never be complete rest until that tire is completely restored. You really just need a new tire. See, we were made for a life of a, a comfort and rest and peace. But when the incidents of this last month started to happen, we start to realize that there is still a hole in our tire. And we can go three weeks or three years or four years, but air is constantly being sucked out of that tire. And all of us have this yearning for this new tire to come, a new creation, a kingdom not built with hands. All of creation is groaning for this and we're waiting for the kingdoms of this world to become the kingdoms of our God and of its Christ. But until that happens, the air is always going to be leaking out of the tire. Pastor, look, I get it, I came here today, but my heart is heavy. My thoughts are heavy. I am confused. What is happening? How do I find steadiness in this chaos? Here is the answer. And I want you to just touch someone next to you and say, it's your vision. You can either set your vision in verse 2 on the wicked, or you can set your vision on God in his holy temple. When the foundations are being destroyed, we ask the question, what can the righteous do? When you don't know where to turn and the wicked seem as though they are prospering, when despair and anxiety and worriness, worry and hopelessness abound, when you are concerned about the next generation and elections and powers and radical religious groups, when racial divides that we thought we overcame pop back up and are prevalent, when sin is called good, when morality is subjective, when pride and the state of our own ego is considered as progress, the only answer is for us to begin to to center our vision on Jesus. Fix your gaze on Jesus. The picture of Yahweh seated in his throne room, in his majesty with the final say, that is the only anchor for our soul. The Hebrew 6 declares this because God wanted to make the unchanging nature of his purpose clear to the heirs of what was promised. He confirmed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, it's impossible for God to lie. We have fled to take hold of the hope set before us and we are greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for our soul. It is firm and secure cure and that anchor enters into the inner sanctuary where Jesus has entered already on our behalf if your soul is being tossed back and forth if you are exhausted and hopeless and overwhelmed there is an anchor and the way you get to that anchor is you fix your gaze upon him this passage in Psalm 11 ends with this high note he says the upright will gaze upon his face God is our refuge. The first line speaks of the safety. God is my refuge. And the last line is we will gaze upon his face. That line speaks of the condition of my heart. Beholding his face means I'm a reflection of his character. My, my mind is the mind of Christ. My thoughts and my ways are the disposition of Jesus. It speaks of intimacy. I'm gazing the one I love. It speaks of fellowship. We must move, church, away from only wanting the protection of God, but rather desiring the communion with God. 
The usefulness of God should never usurp the worthiness of God. 1 Peter 1.8 says this, and I love this verse. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though we have not seen him, we love him. There are many people here today tuning in that have not seen him, but they love him. The Presbyterian Journal tells of a story about William Dyke. He was a British man who was blinded in the earlier years of his life due to an accident. And although he was handicapped, he led quite an academic life and did many things. And he found a beautiful girl who, in spite of his own disability, decided to unite her life with his. Sometime before the wedding, Dyke's case came to the attention of a skillful surgeon who suggested that there might be something for his recovery. And he put himself into the hands of the surgeon. The surgery was performed, and on the day of the wedding, the bandages were removed, and he could see once again. And imagine that he saw his bride for the first time when she walked down that church aisle. And there was joy. The sign was the fulfillment of what he had already done. He already held her hand. He already listened to her voice. He already had a relationship. He already found the love of his life. And he loved her before he ever gazed upon her. And I want you to know the sight of God is coming. First, 2 Timothy 4.8, the crown of righteousness is in store for those who long and love for his appearing. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb and down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit in every month. And the leaves are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light or the lamp or the light of any sun for the Lord God will give them light and he will reign with them forever and ever. The anchor for our soul in this stressful crazy time and in the middle of chaos is our ability to focus on Jesus. You know, I, I haven't shared this story before in public. But almost 14 years ago now, when my mom's body was completely riddled with cancer, I asked her the night before she died, I said, Mom, what would happen if you saw Jesus today? And she grabs my face and she says, Thaddeus, that would be great. And she said, Caleb, I want you to play this song on repeat. And I had never heard the song prior to that day, and I never forgot the song after that, but this song helped her in the moment when she was passing from life to death, and it was a simple song that said, Master, Redeemer, Savior of the world, Wonderful Counselor, Bright Morning Star. Lily of the valley, provider and friend. He was yesterday, he'll be tomorrow, the beginning and the end. And then they rise up, but the angels called him Jesus, born of a virgin. Little Mary called him Yeshua, but I call him Lord. The gospel that we preach is of a humanity that was separated from God due to our sin, and we could not get back to God. So God enters into our humanity and brings us back to him by bearing in his person the punishment we deserved. And he rose again from the grave, and he came so that we too can have eternal life if we place our faith and our trust in him. He is still the anchor for our soul. When the foundations are being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Church, here's what we can do. Stand against injustice motivated not by hatred but by our love fix our eyes on Jesus I challenge you if you are a member of Freedom Church that you would stand against injustice in any of its forms I pray today for not just refuge and protection in you but for the longing in our hearts to see your face the face of God 
If you're at home, wherever you're watching, I, I dare you to just stand with me for a moment. We're going to take just a moment of silence for the life of George Floyd. We will say the name George Floyd to remind us that we still have work to do. God, we will check the inconsistencies in our own hearts and we will try to become the bridge as you've called us to be peacemakers. We pray for all of those that we lose every weekend in the city of Chicago to violence and all of the lives that have been affected by the horrors of the last few weeks. We cry out in continuity with the saints of old, Maranatha, Jesus, would you come quickly? But as long as God you declare delay, we will declare your kingdom. We will display your love. We will walk in your spirit. God, I pray for every person listening that we would be branded by the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and especially in these times, self control. We ask God that you would overwhelm us with your goodness for every heavy heart and hopeless situation and anxiety ridden home. God, I pray for your goodness and your peace and your glory to rest on our homes, God, for your glory and for your name's sake. God, we collectively ask you to heal our land. Heal our land. And start with us, start with me, start with my home, start with my church, start with the community of Lansing where we're at. God, let the change start with us. Would you please heal our land? That you would heal our land, that you would heal our land. relationship and reconciliation and I think I believe that this song is such a prophetic message for our time if we stop loving the way we want to love we stop loving the way we think we stop giving people what we think they need and love on the terms that God defines all these ills that we see in our communities and in our homes and in our families and in our society, God will show up. Can we sing this a couple times? Like over ourselves? Can we sing it a couple times over LA? Can we sing it a couple times from wherever you're from and wherever you're going? If we stop loving, God will heal our wounds. Come on. Sing that. God will heal our wounds. If we stop loving on our own terms. And if we start loving on our own terms, there'll still be a storm. Yes, it will. Grace will lead us home. We start loving. Yeah. 